Well, thank you, Maureen, for that prayer. And uh, thank you to Jane for conducting and organizing, for Sherry for leading, Mom for playing. Janae, thank you for every week setting us up. You see, I'm holding the microphone today. The lapel mic has gone out. Um, and I have a loud enough voice that I could just do this without the mic, but it would not go to the Zoom uh, broadcast. So I'm going to hold this today, and we'll juggle the scriptures in my notes and uh, hopefully still manage through. We come to the end of the course. Um, thanks for sticking with me. We've been discussing the names of Jesus Christ, different name titles. We could do this every week for a year and not get through every appropriate name title. Um, but we've talked about the firstborn. We've talked about uh, the Messiah. We've talked about the name Jehovah. We've talked about the name, the messenger of the covenant. Uh, what else have we done? What have I missed? The great judge. Last week we talked about the great judge. Um, I couldn't settle on one final name. So today we're going to switch it up a little bit. Instead of going a deep dive for... 70 minutes uh, on one particular name, we're going we're gonna to go a little bit more rapid fire and maybe make it through three or four names. So that's my intention today. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to make it through a few of these and we'll just, we'll just go where, I've got an extra set of notes if someone would like those. Um, we'll just see where the wind takes us today. Uh, the first name that I wanted to examine with you comes from the book of Revelation. The bright and morning star. The bright and morning star. I wanted to to work through that idea with you for a moment, and I think the place to do it is to read it just in the text. So open up your Bibles and go to the book of Revelation. Everyone says Revelations. That's not the name of the book. It's Revelation, right? Um, go to Revelation chapter 22. In September, I was able to take 45 of you um, over to the Mediterranean, and we followed in the footsteps of Paul. We went to a number of the places that, that he was, and we, and we took a ship out to the island of Patmos, uh, where John was when he wrote this text. And uh, it's kind of fun to see. We don't know exactly where he was. They took us to a cave they said he was, but um, nonetheless, it was nice to put him in context. Uh, of this great revelation. And, and it really was an honor to be foreordained to write this revelation. Remember that Nephi saw some of it, and the Lord said, don't write anymore, Nephi. That's for John. And then we come to the uh, brother of Jared, and he sees some of it, and the Lord says, don't write anymore. This is for John. He's named both play times by name. So this was a privilege to be able to unfold this uh this mystery as it is, or this apocalypse, this revelation. Uh, let's, let's pick this up here in verse 4. This is speaking of the servants of God who would, uh, who would worship and serve in his presence. Just speaking of the names, I mean, we could almost go to the first verse and I won't read them, but you see the water of life, you see the throne of God, you see the name the Lamb, all right? Then you go down and you see the tree of life. Those are all symbols of Jesus Christ. This is the Revelation uh, 22, and I actually took you back to verse 1. But you see there the water of life, uh, the throne of God, the lamb, the tree of life. Uh, and then in verse 4 it says, And they, these are the faithful servants of them who serve the Lord, they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. All right? Now, we began this course by talking about a name. What is, what's in a name? What does a name mean? Uh, we came to the conclusion that names have everything to do with identity, but they have everything to do with authority. Identity and authority. 
Um, in the 109th section, for instance, which is the dedicatory prayer that Joseph Smith offers, dedicating the Kirtland Temple, he says, oh, we need to build a house. We will build a house. We have built a house that we now dedicate where you can put your name upon them. You put your name upon them. So here we have this reference seeing the same thing that the faithful will see the face of the Lord and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. He's speaking about the celestial kingdom. He's speaking about a future day. There will be no night there. And they need no candle. Neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. That's a promise of the eventual station of those who dwell in quote-unquote celestial burnings, in the glory of the celestial kingdom. Uh, these are those who are members of the church of the firstborn. These are they who are exalted. These are they, and we have the qualifications for who attain this status in the 76th section when we talk about, you know, baptism, making covenants, um, enduring to the end. Uh, these are they who live in the presence of the star himself. Um, there, it's interesting to me that it says they need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. That's interesting. Now, I don't know exactly how that works. Is that a planet that's rotating, doesn't need another orb? I, I, I suppose um, we're going to talk a little bit about great stars, and it's the star that brings the orbit, orbiting planets around them. It's the sun that does that. Um, there's no night in this, this, this description at least. Uh, and it's the glory of the Lord. And you would say it's also the glory of the exalted beings who are there. Remember in section 29 when the Lord is promised to come in his glory in the last day? And it says, and, and they that come with him in his glory. It's part of that collective glory of those who are resurrected that actually caused the earth to be consumed. The earth rolls together as a scroll and the elements melt with a fervent heat. Remember that language? That's, there's glory with those who stand with Christ and with Elohim. So um, that's, a, that's all preamble perhaps to what I uh, wanted to read to you here about uh, the star himself. So look here at Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. That's a name title we could have explored. We didn't do that this semester. That comes from Isaiah, and we have it in our second Nephi, uh, chapter 21, that talks about the root and the stem and the branch of David, right? And he emphasizes this again. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. I am the bright and morning star. Well, why that imagery? Why that imagery? Why that symbol? Why is Christ, uh, why is the symbol of a bright star an appropriate symbol for Jesus Christ? What is the symbol intended to teach us? Remember that John is writing... Uh, to nations and peoples and histories in the future uh, that are all different culturally, contextually, what they understand, you know, linguistically. But symbols cut across culture. They cut across time. They teach. So I, I want to ask you, why the symbol of a star? And not just a star, but a bright and a morning star. What do you think? Yeah. It seems like hope. Is that what you said? Why? Mm. All right. All right. There's a sense of hope there. What other thoughts do you have? Why a bright and morning star? Yeah. Yeah. The morning. 
uh, has something to do with the idea of the firstborn. It's early. You know, we're going to read about Lucifer, who is also a son of the morning. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, why else? To start, yeah, Don? Yeah. This the first quarter of the actual period. And then even though the sunrise is coming up, it's still sweet. Yeah. It's so bright and happy. It's glorious. It's bright and brilliant. The stars to the ancients maybe meant a great deal more than they do to us, right? First of all, they didn't have all the ambient light, the city light that was drowning out the heavens. They were off um in less densely populated areas. They were often rural, they were agricultural. And what did they do at night? They had a few candles, some olive oil, and a lamp. Um, but when the sun went down, that was it. It wasn't any computer. It wasn't any TV. It wasn't the NFL on Thursday night. Okay. They, they, were, they were out, and they were observing what? They were observing the stars. That was, that was with them. That's how they, they identified. And of course, the Polynesians would navigate, the, the seafarers. They would... They, they lived by the stars. And that's maybe one of the points that we ought to say, say here is this idea of navigation, of orientation, right? We orient ourselves based on the stars. They're fixed. They're steady. Um, and so he's called here the bright and the morning star. Um, turn the page, you'll see, well, did we read verse, oh, it's over in Revelation chapter 2, verse 28. We don't need to flip there, I'll read it to you. Oh, no, I guess we do, because I actually cut and paste the wrong portion into your notes, so I apologize. Go to, go to Revelation chapter 2, and you'll see that term once again here in verse 28. mentions that I will give unto him the morning star. This is, again, speaking to the faithful. I will give unto him the morning star. I've wondered if that doesn't have something to do with the manifestation of Jesus Christ. I wonder if that has something to do with calling an election or more sure word of prophecy. I will give unto him the morning star. Um, well, let's look at another passage here. Um, and now we're going to take the adversary as the imitation. Go to Second Nephi chapter 24. If you prefer, you could go to Isaiah 14, but we'll do it here in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, go to Second Nephi 24. This is the one of the desolations where you talk about the different kings. We're speaking here about the king of Babylon, but the king of Babylon is compared to the devil and Babylon compared to the world. And you have this messianic prophecy. And in the middle of that messianic prophecy, you have uh, this reference to another morning star. Let's read it. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So there's a similar, similar reference here to, the, to Lucifer being a son of the morning, one with authority, one of the early sons. Art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above what? Above the stars of God, I will sit also in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So here's a reference to a congregation of stars. And, and who are the stars? You and I, right? This is Job 38, the morning stars shouted for joy in the premortal world when Jesus Christ was nominated. Um, you and I are also symbols of stars. So there's, there are stars in the firmament, and there are great stars. Maybe the difference between Venus and 
some dimly lit star that the James Webb telescope sees in some distant galaxy in terms of how much light it gives off, right? But here is Lucifer who wants to exalt his throne above the stars of the congregation, in the congregation of the north. The north was a reference to the place of God. Um, as, you ori as the Jew orients himself to the east, his right hand would face south, his left hand would face north. And, I'm sorry, flip that. I'm sorry, I did that wrong. His right hand would face north. You see, that's the covenant side. And so the north was always supposed to be some glorious place. It's some place marked by divinity where the south would have the opposite connotation. And here you have this idea that Satan will go and wants to exalt himself above all the stars and sit in the north where God sits on a throne and put himself above everybody else. He says, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, and they shall say, Is this the man that made earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms? I always think that's such a interesting prophecy that someday you'll see Lucifer for who he is and say, is this the man that caused all this carnage? Is this the man? And yet he's referred to as a morning star, one clothed with authority. And he was. And he fell. And why did he fall? Lots of reasons. But one of the reasons is he wanted to take the light, all the light, and he wanted the glory for himself. Right? The morning star gives his light away. There's, there's some symbol um, I, I like, actually, in reference to Venus. Um, again, his name. What does Lucifer mean? It means light bearer. The name Lucifer means light bearer. In the Hebrew, Lucifer is Hillel ben Shafar, meaning the shining one or the son of dawn. All right? It also has a connection with the planet Venus. So, both the, how do, you have the same symbol describing Jesus Christ, and you have it also describing Lucifer. Are we okay with that? I see some yeses and I see some noes. Uh, well, it, again, symbols. You, let's, let's examine the symbol and let's see what's happening. Uh, the symbol can teach more than one thing. Uh, and here, w in, the, in the case of Lucifer, he's the bright and morning star, but he's also that star that hangs stubbornly on the horizon. The last star to give his light way to what is the eventual dawning of the sun that must eclipse his light. And he holds on stubbornly and will not yield until finally he is forced to. You see, you can see that sort of symbolism with the, with the morning star. Um, and so maybe one more place we go, and this, this, this to our Pearl of Great Price, if you want to go over to Abraham chapter 3, this just, when I was in college, I really discovered this chapter, and I, uh, I fell in love with it. And uh, we'll just spend a minute on it. The first thing you notice is that Abraham is the, is the student here. He's being taught by the Lord. And he is observing a vision through the Urim and Thummim. Right? And I, Abraham, had the Urim and Thummim, which the Lord my God gave unto me in Ur of the Chaldees. So Abraham has this Urim and Thummim. We just read in our Come, Follow Me, uh, the brother of Jared's. Uh, account and we see that he's given the interpreters remember now I don't know if it's two of the 16 stones that the Lord touches with his fingers it may be it may not be it's unclear in the text it wouldn't bother me if it would it'd be kind of nice actually um, somehow the Lord touches 16 stones with his finger um, and they, they're stones that are molten uh, and made into semi-transparent glass so there's some refining process, you know, sort of getting rid of the impurities that might obstruct the mortal view, right, that are associated with these interpreters that would later be called the Urim and Thummim. Um, 
They're the same Urim and Thummim that are passed down. Joseph Smith has possession of those two Urim and Thummim in the silver rim of a bow and by which he translates the Book of Mormon until the training wheels come off and he's able to do it without. And he receives some of the early revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants by the Urim and Thummim. And then again, the training wheels come off and he receives direct revelation. But, but here you have Abraham who is staring through the Urim and Thummim. And what does the Lord show him? He shows him the cosmos. He shows him the heavens. He shows him, you know, what you and I attempt to see through the, through the telescope. And I saw the stars, verse 2, that they were very great. And that one of them was nearest unto the throne of God. And there were many great ones that were near unto it. So Abraham somehow is able to pierce to the center of the universe. And he sees a lot of stars, but he sees one that is more dramatic, more bright, more great than all the others. And the Lord said unto me, verse 3, these stars, the great ones that you see, these are the governing ones. And the name of the great one is Kolob. Maybe mom was asking me what hymn we could have sang. We should have sang, if you could hide a Kolob. Because it is near unto me. For I am the Lord thy God. I have set this one, this star, I have set it to govern all those which belong to the same order as that upon which thou standest. I always focus in on that word set. This is God. This is Christ speaking by divine investiture of authority as if he were the Father. And he's saying, I have set. What does that mean? I've organized. It's intentional. It's not haphazard. It's not just big bangish and, and randomness flying through the heavens. I have ordained this very specifically to be in this spot at this time to serve its purpose. I have set it. And if you go through uh, the next five verses, which we won't do, you'll just see that the word appointed and set appear, appear again, again, and again. See it in verse 6 really quickly that the reckoning and the set time, the set time of the earth, the set time of the greater light, the set to rule the day, the set time of the lesser night, the set time of the lesser night, again, you just see it again, again, and again. And what you're seeing there is the divine order and organization. It's meticulous. It's set. It's ordained. It's established. It's pre-configured. It's pre-thought of. It's intentional. And it's the Father who lays claim upon the creative authority. He has that authority and he delegates it to his son. Now, now you come down to verse 9 where our story about stars continues. And thus there shall be the reckoning time of one planet above another until thou come nigh unto Kolob, which Kolob is after the reckoning of the Lord's time, which Kolob is set, there it is again, nigh unto the throne of God to what? To govern. To govern all those planets which belong to the same order as that upon which thou standest. So, you have this universe. And I want this to be three-dimensional, so, and it can't be. It's only two-dimensional. But at the middle, you would see this great star. And we call this star Kolob because it's nearest to the throne of God, right? And it's the bright and glorious star that Abraham sees in vision. It's the morning star. It's the bright and glorious star. Uh, and then it says that, it, that there are governing stars. There are governing ones. And in fact, if you turn the page and you look in the facsimile descriptions, you go about halfway down the page. Well, I'll just point it out to you here. You can see this hydrocephalus uh, drawing, and you see there in figure 5 that they're talking about the governing planets also. They're governed by some Egyptian concept that I'm not familiar with. 
and it is said by the Egyptians to be the sun, and to borrow its light from Kolob through the medium of that word, which is the grand key, or in other words, the governing power, which governs what? 15 other fixed planets or stars. So what do we have going on here? We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And it says that they get their light from Kolob. So it's the light of the sun, the son of God, that is extended to the 15 governing ones. And I don't know, but that 12 plus 3 equals 15 where you have the, the governing ones. There's order here. It's intentional. Who are the governing ones? You see, this entire chapter is not about stars. This entire chapter is about souls. You see that in verse 18. The Lord shows them all these stars, and then he uses this little connector he says as also as also if there be two spirits and everything after that point in time in this revelation is talking about spirits and this is the passage that speaks about every spirit having glory and having intelligence which is the light of truth light but then it also says that there was one who stood among them, just like Kolob. And what does it say? He was, quote, greater than they all. He was greater than they all collectively. You take all of them and you add up their glory, and Kolob was greater. Jesus Christ was greater. In terms of his experience, in terms of the light and knowledge and power that he had obtained to at that point in time. And thus, he's ordained to govern the governing ones. And then you would have all the stars of the firmament all out here and, you know, Ron, which star do you want to be? You want to be that one right there? All right. You're going to be, there's stars all over the place and they are governed by the governing ones. I see in here a lot of metaphors, one of which is the uh, order of the priesthood, that there are those that govern ecclesiastically from whom we should receive light and truth, insofar as they are getting light and truth from the day star, right? And, and what happens? This... The whole half of that, first half of that chapter is about the revolutions of planets and their speed. And you're like, what am I reading? Um, and, and what I think one of the things we're learning is that in the divine ordering of the cosmos, if you are not oriented or have some gravitational orbit around Jesus Christ, by ver and by extension, the prophets and apostles who are instructed to govern in his kingdom, then you have no center. You have no orientation. In fact, in fact, the opposite. What's the opposite of, of being set and appointed? Being untethered and chaos. It's chaos. Don't you see that, brothers and sisters? I will neglect what President Nelson says. I will refuse to sustain the brethren, I will deny my covenants. And what happens? Chaos. And what happens when the alternative? I will sustain, I will, and I know I'll sin, but I'll try and repent and I'll try and do better and I'll strive. There's, a, there's an order that comes into your life. Yeah. Well, where's the father in all of this? The, the scripture says that Kolob is nearest the throne of God. So we would, we would think, Father's right there. 
Maybe even the big star is his and the kolab is the one right next to it. I, you know, all we know is it says that it's nearest the throne of God. We mean the Father. Yeah, we mean the Father. So just some, some fun sort of imagery here about this star. And I want to move on because we have other concepts to cover. But another place you would look is the 88th section that talks about the light of Christ and that it's Christ who is in the sun and in the stars and in the moon and the glory by which they were made, right? And it's the same light that openeth your eyes and quickeneth your understanding, you see? All of that we trace back to the morning star himself. So uh, there is a name title that, uh, that just deserves a little bit of attention. And again, examine your light, you know, know where it comes from. Okay, uh, let's do another one here. I'm going to put the mic down and erase the board for a minute. Although, before we leave it, come on, we've got to get Elder Holland his due. Let's do that. We love Elder Holland. My declaration, says Jeffrey R. Holland, is that this is precisely what the gospel of Jesus Christ offers us, especially in times of need. There is help. There is happiness. There really is light at the end of the tunnel. It is the light of the world, the bright and morning star. The light that is endless, that can never be darkened. Isn't that, that's the hope you mentioned. It can never be darkened, right? It is the very son of God himself. It is the return of hope. And Jesus is the sun, S-U-N. To any who may be struggling to see that light and find that hope, I say, hold on, keep trying. God loves you. Things will improve. Christ comes to you in his more excellent ministry with a future of better promises. He is your high priest of good things to come. Okay, let's pick another name. All right, let's talk a little bit about this name, Son of Man. It appears in the New Testament some 70 times or more. Uh, son of Man, Son of Man. Yeah, Lori? That's where we're going. That's where we're going, yeah. But, but to the, 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 the question was, doesn't that have something to do with Son of Man of Holiness? And we're going to read that in the Pearl of Great Price. To the Christian world that does not have the Pearl of Great Price, the concept of the Son of Man um, is linked to the idea that Jesus Christ has a mortal mother. And indeed he does. Um, but it's identifying the blood that throws through, flows through his veins, his ability to suffer. And there's nothing wrong with that idea. We support that. But uh, the Pearl of Great Price teaches us something more that I think expands greatly what that what that name means. So uh, the Savior himself asks in Matthew 16, remember when they go up to um, Caesarea Philippi, he says to Peter, he says, but whom sayest thou that I, the Son of Man, am? Now Peter has a revelatory moment uh, where the Lord, he says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, and how do you know? For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven, right? And Peter is, is saying, no, the Son of Man is the Son of God linking man and God in that, you know, if you do the associative powers they teach you in the seventh grade in mathematics, right? Put an equal sign between the man and God. Let's find that concept more clearly spelled out uh, in, again, we're in the Pearl of Great Price today. Um, let's go to Moses chapter 6 verse, well, let's see, where would we want to start? 
Well, we'll just go right to verse 57. This is Enoch. This chapter and the next chapter are Enoch. Uh, this is just an entire, you know, the book of Moses was a translation of the Bible. It was the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. But the Enoch passages aren't in the Bible. They're just a, a complete whole scale insertion into our text. We're not going verse for verse and changing this or that. We're just inserting entire passages here. That's what we're reading. This came to the prophet Joseph Smith, just like other revelations have come to him. Verse 57. Uh, I'm in Moses chapter 6, verse 57. Wherefore, teach it unto your children that all men everywhere must repent or they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. For, and why? For no unclean thing can dwell there. And let's put meat on the bone to that concept. No unclean thing can dwell there or dwell in his presence. For, in the language of Adam, man of holiness is his name. And the name of his only begotten is the Son of Man, even Jesus Christ, a righteous judge who shall come in the meridian of time. So, what does this tell us? In the Adamic, the name of, heaven, of, of God the Father is what? Man of holiness. And it's by virtue of his holiness that we're not permitted to dwell there unless we resemble that holiness. Right? How does one become holy? Well, Ron, that's the question you asked me before the class. How do we become? Uh, there's a lot of answers to that. But a short answer to that is that we become holy in degrees by the process of sanctification. It's the Holy Ghost that comes upon us and that purges the filth and the dross from our soul. And in degrees, we just incrementally get a little bit more bright, a little bit more light-filled, a little bit more like the morning star, you see. You become more holy. Uh, you become saints, right? What does the name saint mean? Sanctu in the Latin is that which is holy. And I've told this story before, but when I was a teenager, I used to go, rest, um, we had six boys in the family, three girls, big boys, all play in sports and in high school, and we would wrestle in the living room. And I'd pick up my brother, or he'd pick me up, and we'd body slam each other. And the whole house would shake. And mom would come and stop, wrestle, go to the basement to wrestle. So, so dad had to have a family home evening to address the living room wrestling. And he said, our living room, and it was a modest house, professor, nine kids, you know. And, and, and he said, this living room is the sanctum sanctorum which means the holy of holies in the house, all right? This is, you don't wrestle here. Um, that's the song too. That's the, that's the sanctification that happens. Um, we refer to the holy of holies, obviously, as the most sacred place. Um, and so this man of holiness is sanctified. And that's how you and I become holy is through the process of sanctification. It's, uh, and, and part of that, frankly, is that You'll progress over time and through eternity, and you'll be resurrected, but you'll progress beyond your resurrection. You'll be judged at the final judgment bar of God, and you will progress beyond that. And really, this process of deification, which we know relatively little about, I presume has something to do with an ordinance, an ordination, a gift, an endowment, a dispensing. You don't earn it in the classrooms in the sky, all right? It's dependent upon your faithfulness and the Lord's trust in you. 
and it may take some great time. The, Lord, the prophet Joseph Smith says it will take a great time beyond the, other, the veil before we arrive at, uh, at that destination that puts us you know, like unto God, right? And so we have this reference here, Enoch, uh, of the man of holiness. Interestingly, in the Adamic, why do we care about the Adamic? That's the language that God uses. We're all using this watered down. You know, we always talk about like, hey, science, technology, we get better and better, and incrementally we just get smarter and everything gets better, right? No, Joseph Fielding Smith talked about the de-evolution of language. He talked about how we had a pure language which could convey with greater power than what we are subject to with our English. I like English. It's what I speak. But, but this Adamic was greater. In fact, it's interesting, again, reading the brother of Jared this week. Do you remember what he says about the language that he uses? And we, again, Joseph Fielding Smith assumes that the brother of Jared is speaking Adamic prior to the, sc the scattering uh, of the languages. Now, in Genesis 10, it does mention that there are various tongues. But I'm going to side with uh, Joseph Fielding Smith. It says that, hey, it, that, that he's speaking a pure and refined language because he says that, in fact, it's Moroni who says, the words that I'm writing do not carry the same power as the words that the brother of Jared wrote. His simple writing of them were overpowering to those who read them. I, that's very interesting to me. That's very interesting to me. I think it has something to do with this language. So in the Adamic, you have this name, man of holiness, and that's his name title. That's what you would call, instead of saying Heavenly Father or saying Elohim, which is a name, by the way, that we sort of attached to the Father. That's not Old Testament scriptural. The name Elohim is plural, the gods. 1916, Joseph F. Smith said, hey, we're going to come and we're going to define this and we're going to attach the name Elohim to the Father, you see. But again, we're using language to try and get around some things. Let's go back to the original. In the 78th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, we have the phrase, Amen. And this is in the Adamic, once again. And you, that's the name of God. And you have... Son, Amen, which is the name of Jesus Christ in the Adamic, or, or, or a title referencing the Son of God in the Adamic. And thus we have Adam on thy Amen, the place where Adam meets God, you see. And so that revelation points us to to this description, let's read one more. Go to Moses chapter 7. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 35. Behold, I am God. Man of holiness is my name. There it is again. We could have another class on this one. Man of counsel is my name. And we could have another class on this. And endless and eternal are my names also. Those are different name titles. Yeah, Lori. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's good. If you, it, hugely important. If you couldn't hear what Lori was saying, she when she was in college, she you know she took she took a class and it was actually my uncle Joseph Fielding McConkie who was teaching that and and he taught this principle as his father taught him that this concept of the man of holiness was so important because it completely. It speaks to the corporeal nature of God's being. And the Son of Man, the son of man likewise. And so um, this, you know, this, this defies the creeds, this defies Nicaea, this def def defies 
uh, Athanasia, all the creeds of the uh, early Christian father days, 325 AD, all this sort of thing where, where they literally, via a vote, robbed God of his body. And he thus became, as the Westminster Abbey Book of Prayer says, a God without body parts or passions. That's who we worship, you see. And, and to, understand, to have faith in God, you must first understand his nature, his character, and his attributes, lectures on faith. And if we don't understand who God is, you see, we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to first solve that problem. When I was a young missionary in Taiwan and we're teaching the first vision, which was always the most powerful portion to, to teach, I, was, I guarded that jealously. I said, companion, I, I, I get that one. Um, that wasn't fair of me, but... And I just memorized that. Well, It's the, I saw a pillar of light above, and, and the whole way through. You know, and I would always make sure that the investigator I was teaching had a concept in their mind of who God wa was, what he looked like. That it wasn't Buddha on a lotus flower descending in the grove. I wanted them to have an idea that we were talking about a man of holiness, an exalted, glorified, resurrected, celestialized man. And this is what the prophet Joseph Smith clearly taught. And this is also what gets you Latter-day Saints in a lot of hot water in the Christian world. Joseph Smith, page two. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power was to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him in the form of a man. Like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man. That's from uh, the King, King Follett Discourse. That's what the prophet was teaching. Um, now, Brigham Young was Joseph's best student. He often simply paraphrases and restates what the prophet taught. And he said this, If we could see our Heavenly Father, we would see a being similar to our earthly parent with this difference. Our Father in heaven is exalted and glorified. He has received his thrones, his principalities, his powers. Where is he getting that? All right, that's the 132nd section. We've got a revelation that talks about thrones and principalities and dominions and all heights and all depths and that's language that has been translated and adopted in temple ordinances right Brigham Young quotes it there and he sits as a governor I like that phrase in the context of our discussion about stars and the governing one sits as a governing as a monarch and overrules kingdoms thrones and dominions that have been bequeathed to him so here we have this idea about an exalted man, man of holiness. So when we see that phrase, son of man, let's, let's remember what we're talking about. Yeah, Sherry. Uh, oh, oh, it's Adamic, not the Egyptians. Amen? I don't know. I don't think so. Do they use Ra? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know the linkage between the Egyptians and the Adamic on that. Yeah. You, you know, the, the, fourth thing, uh, the fourth name title I'm going to address today is the name Amen, not Amen. Um, but you make a point. Where the, the name Amen is also a name title for Christ. We're going to explore that a little bit. Um, but as to the connection, I mean, the, the word Amen comes from a Hebrew word. 
Uh, and I don't know that it, you can draw the linkage between that and the Adamic word amen. My Adamic's a little rusty, but I'm not sure, uh, it, you know, about that. But I, but your point, it, as we close a prayer, what are we really saying? I'm gonna, that'll be our fourth. That'll be our fourth name title today. We'll get to that. Uh, okay, let's. If you want to read in your notes, you can see that it was actually originally a W M E N, and then it was changed uh, in our scriptures to A H. M-A-N, but you can go ahead and read that. Let's, let's move on to a another concept here, a new name title. So we've done the star, the bright morning star. We've done the son of man. And now I'd like to talk to you about this phrase that is a, pops up in the New Testament a few times, the head of the church. The head of the church. Um, there's actually a bit that I want to get through here, so I'm not going to walk you through every passage. You can see them in your notes here. You see in Colossians 1, 18 through 20, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, meaning the first resurrected, that in all things he might have preeminence. Ephesians 5 is really good. For the husband is the head of the wife. Oh, that kind of gets you in trouble in these days. But <laughs> As Christ is the head of the church. And I thought, it, oh, the husband the head of the wife. You just go find the couple that you respect the most and you draw all the conclusions you want to about that phrase. As Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now let's do one, we'll do this one in a little bit more detail. Go to Ephesians 4. All right. He's talking about there is one body. He's talking about the church. The body of Christ is the church. Because everyone has a different utility, different function, different purpose, right? Verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. We use the word patriarch for evangelist. And some pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, ministering, what we do for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto the perfect man under the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ so here we have this definition of the body of Christ and Paul goes on to talk about that we in verse 15 but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Well, what are the, what are the practical implications of such a doctrine? Um, let me ask you two questions. This is a, let's do a quick exercise. Um, last week or two weeks ago, we talked about Christ being the messenger of the covenant. We talked about Christ being an Elias. Joseph Smith's translation of John chapter 1 talks about Christ as an Elias, right? Meaning one who would restore. What did Christ in his mortal ministry, what evidence do we have, I should ask, in the scriptures do we have that Christ was more than a great moral teacher and a miracle worker, but that he came to do a work which was to restore, as the Elias, and establish a church. What scriptural evidence can you give me that he was organizing, that he was turning keys? Just shout them out, and I'm going to write them down. What, 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 what do we know, brothers and sisters? All right. He ordains and he commissions 12 apostles, right? What else? 
uh, uh, one at a time. Lisa, what would you say? Okay, so this idea of keys, and we'll go to Matthew 16, where he says to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, the rock of Revelation, Cephas, not the papacy, but the, the rock of Revelation, right? Um, will I reveal keys that allow you to open doors and organize? And then you also mentioned, Lisa, Matthew 17, which deals with the Mount of Transfiguration, where you have Elijah and Moses, oh, and by the way, John the Baptist there, and those two come and they, with their translated bodies, confer keys upon the heads of the Meridian Day First Presidency, Peter, James, and John. So, so yes, we have Christ overseeing the conveying of priesthood keys. Ron, what, what was your concept? Other officers in the church. He says we have, he's speaking about organization. That's the same idea as keys. You see, keys organize. So we have prophets and apostles and teachers and ministers, right? Evangelists, or I'm going to call them patriarch. All right? That was all part of the church that Paul is writing to the Ephesians. This is how we're organized. What else does Christ do to establish a church? Yes, Bill? All right, so he institutes ordinances. We have the sacrament instituted the night before he is crucified. What else do we have? All right, so we've got sacrament. We should have done this in reverse order. Baptism is the first ordinance. And we know that Christ himself baptizes. Joseph Smith's translation says the Pharisees approached him and said, how come you baptized? He says, I did baptize. I just didn't baptize as much as John. But Jesus Christ baptizes. All right. So he baptizes. He institutes the sacrament. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, so he does bring a higher law, the law of Christ. And I might poke and prod you on that and say, how does that relate to a church? Yeah. Yes. He, he, he restores priesthood. And maybe this comes back to your statement. This higher law, the church is administered by the Melchizedek priesthood. And then he commands his apostles to go forth and to heal and to bless just like he had been doing. Do you remember how nervous they were? Uh, wait, wait, you want us to go and do what you've been doing? Yeah, that, that was intimidating. That was scary. But he, and this, uh, we, uh, this speaks to another organization facet, which is that he says go two by two, Right? You go forth two by two, and you minister and administer my gospel. There are more, but that's a good start. We could get into the endowment. We could get into... Well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he institutes the resurrection. But I, I think that if we think of him as a moral teacher and even as a redeemer but don't see in him his role as Elias, which is to restore all things. <laughs> it's the keys of what? The kingdom. Organized, established. All right, and he's the head. He's the head of that kingdom. Uh, he's here to, to, to be the head of the church. He's, he's not just, here's the good news and walks away. Yeah, Bill? I think I got your thought, Bill. I'll help you out. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Yeah, I read you. I got you. I got you. Yeah, the government shall be upon his shoulder, right? He's going to bear the burden of the governance of his kingdom as a monarch and as a king. He will reign personally on the earth in the millennium, and he will oversee the, the, the religious and the civic affairs. He has that kingdom responsibility. Now, um... This is just, we don't have time for all this. We've got too much. Um, you go and think about this question. Why do we need a church today? 
Good question. With a lot of very obvious answers, <laughs> I would say. Not so obvious to those who would leave the church, but we, we, we have this term right now in the mass media, the, the unchurching or the de-churching of our population. And it's just, ugh, it's hard. That's, that, you think about the ramifications of that. Maybe that's connected to the, 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 the next thought exercise. And ask yourself seriously this question. What would your life have been like without the church in it? Start from the very beginning. Remove the experiences, the relationships, the opportunities of service, the ordinances, the worship, the music, the brotherhood and the sisterhood. Let's do a little George Bailey here on the, what's it called? Wonderful Life. Let's remove all of that from your life and ask you the question, are you more or less? Oh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's very obvious. Yes. Yeah, and I and I think there are there are people who don't attend church regularly and still may have affection and love the Savior, but the church is designed specifically to bring you to the Lord. In the power of the ordinances of the kingdom, are the, is the power of godliness manifest? For instance, right? Um, just an interesting thought exercise. Now let's move on. Um, Spencer Kimball says. We do not go to Sabbath meetings to be entertained or even solely to be instructed. We go to worship the Lord. It is an individual responsibility. If the service is a failure to you, you have failed. Ooh, dun, dun, dun. All right. If the service is a failure to you, you have failed. No one can worship for you. You must do it. You must do your own waiting upon the Lord. Well... You know, they spoke more plainly in the 70s, and uh, I kind of like it. I kind of like it. Um, all right, what's this idea of a true church? Well, you arrogant, presumptuous Latter-day Saints, you think you got it all. Here's one de definition of truth. Well, there's many. Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, will, character, glory, and being of God. The word truth in the Bible comes to us from the Hebrew and the Greek words, which mean firmness and stability. Well, is the church true? Um, yes, go ahead and say that. You can send your primary children up to say, I know the church is true, I love my mom and dad. All right, They can say that, and it's okay to train them to say that. The, um, and the reason I say that is because the Lord himself uses that language. And I'm not going to apologize for using the language that the Lord uses. Now, let's talk about what that means and what that doesn't mean. All right? I, I picked out four references here. Um, and for want of time, I'm not going to open the scriptures and read all four of them to you. But in the first section, the opening section of this dispensation, uh, the, the introduction, I should say, to the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says that this church was, quote, the only true and living church. And he said he was collectively pleased with the church. Um, the 23rd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Knight, by the voice of Jehovah, is invited to join with the, quote, true church. 2 Nephi chapter 9, the greatest chapter on the atonement in my estimation, says that the Jews one day, prophetically speaking, would be restored to, quote, the true church. And fold of God. And 4th Nephi 1.26 talks about after hundreds of years of peace and harmony. That when they began to form Nephites and Lamanites and wear costly apparel. Once again they began to deny quote the true church. Now it's a scriptural phrase. 
Does it mean that we are perfect? Clearly not. And that's okay. True means, one more time, that which is consistent with the mind, will, character, glory, and being of God. It's another way of saying the Lord sustains this church. And I believe he's very pleased with the church, collectively speaking. Now, we've got some issues to work through, and we have individual, all of us have problems that we are working on. We're not saying that we're perfect, but we're saying that the Lord has established this and divinely authorized this church, and he is the head of the church. All right? Um, I love this from Elder Holland. Except in the case of his only perfect begotten son, imperfect people are all that God ever has to work with. That must be terribly frustrating to him. But he deals with it, and so should we. And when you see the imperfection, remember that the limitation is not in the divinity of the work. I think that, That's good. Elder Renlund says the same thing. If you receive what the Lord's church offers, you can be perfected in Christ before his church is perfected if it ever is. His goal is to perfect you, not the church. His goal has never been to metaphorically turn, is that a German word? Where's Rudy? I want to hear Rudy say it. Turn Kesegler into diamond. Although he's, uh, he's Finnish. That might be, anyway, it doesn't matter. His goal has been to refine you into pure gold to save and exalt you as a co-inheritor with him in the kingdom. But that needs to become your goal too. It's your choice. Well, there's two, prophets, two apostles who are talking about we don't make the claim that we are perfect. No one would. But you can go ahead and use that term the church is true. I think the Lord sustains that. It's his authorized vehicle to administer the gospel and the ordinances. It's the warehouse of the order. It's the protector of the ordinances, you see, to provide order and continuity. So he is the head of the church. All right. Well, that brings us to this last concept of the amen. Revelation 3, 14. This is another name title for Jesus Christ. These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of of the creation of God. And now down to Corinthians. For all promises of God are, oh, in him are yea, and in him amen. Under the glory of God by us. Capital A. The word amen is Hebrew word that means the God of truth, or it is true. It is also a title of Jesus, indicating that he is God's perfect and final revelation. And if you think by my last little lecture on the trueness of the church, that I don't think there's any goodness outside of the church, you would be wrong. I'm going to quote an evangelical minister here who said, some 70 or more times in our Gospels, we hear the Lord saying, verily I say unto you. The words amen and verily are the same in the original language. The God of truth was here in the person of Jesus. Let us value his sayings. A cognate of the word amen suggests going up to the right hand. God's glory and our blessings alike established in one glorious man. How brilliant and enduring that glory. How sure and eternal our blessing. The amen, name title for Christ, is at the right hand of God. His word is sure and stable. Every promise securely vested in him, God has triumphed. Let us give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Well, brothers and sisters, that brings us to the end. These four names that we reference today. We talked about the bright and morning star, the son of man of holiness, the head of the church, and the amen. Well, I hope at least over the last seven or eight weeks that, that by talking about Christ and in, in his roles, in his name titles, that we've added some perhaps 
clarity or understanding that might help us understand a little bit more about who he is. Uh, I go back to the lectures on faith. It's not until we understand who God is that we can actually exercise faith unto salvation, right? Now, it's one thing to experience God intellectually. It's one thing to read about him in the scriptures. It's one thing to read a book and to process an idea. Uh, it's quite another thing to learn about God experientially. It's quite another thing altogether. You see, Adam and Eve, they were brilliant. Don't get this idea that they were these innocent, um, little, non-educated you know, people bouncing around Eden. They were brilliant, informed, educated beings before they fell. But they did not have the experience of mortality. It was experience that they needed. And just like Adam and Eve, so it is with you and I. We can learn all that we can from the scriptures and from the mouth of prophets and apostles. It's not until we have experiential knowledge with Jesus Christ that we really come to know who he is. That will happen in the travails and the triumphs of your life. That will happen when there is the greatest need. That will happen when we exercise our greatest faith to seek the blessings of the Lord. That will happen as we perform ordinances which bind us to him so that some of him rubs off on us, that we are assimilated, as the prophet said, into his likeness. That happens as we get down in the trenches, you know, and we see people eyeball to eyeball and we serve them the way that he served us, right? That's the type of, in fact, maybe we end with this idea. The 93rd section of the Doctrine and Covenant says, he shows us who Christ was in mortality. All of the healings, all of the prophecies, all of his ministering unto the people. He showed John the Baptist that vision. And then he says, I show you this, that you may know who and how to worship, to know who you worship. I show you so you know what you need to be. To be a Christian is to follow him and to do what he would do and to live as he would do to the best of our ability. And we, yes, we are insufficient. He gets it. He gets it. But I just say to keep striving, keep working, keep, keep trying to become what he wants you to become and what you're foreordained to become. And we can only do that through his name. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.